you raised a lot of questions, and we will dis try to discuss some of them with you. If Arne, you can take place. Yeah. Please, go ahead. Hi, um, Pan Panjaka, the Anti-Cancer Fund. Um, I have a question for all of the panelists. When we think of knowledge transfer, we normally think of knowledge going from the advanced economies to the low middle income countries. Um, but I see on stage after all these presentations some really interesting work. So my question is, what knowledge transfer can we take from the low and middle income countries and bring it to the advanced countries? What can we learn from the work that's been going on in the developing countries? In terms of equal uh, distribution of care? In terms of how we deliver treatment to cancer patients. Mm. Okay, who wants to pick up on that? I'd, I'd yeah, be, Arne. I'd be happy to. Um, Pan, that's exactly what we're doing in the UK. So I'm having conversations with uh, the NHS in the UK. We are leap the thing about India is we're leapfrogging. It's much easier to do something from a low start and clear the landscape and do something quite spectacular than try and fix the NHS, for example. That's a real problem. Um, so we are having conversations about digital technology, about procurement, et cetera, et cetera. We can learn a huge amount. I have another. Please uh, stand up. Um, microphone there. Yes. yes. I'm Per Kogner, pediatric oncologist from Karolinska, and I would address, like to address Maria Angela uh, Shimao concerning, you, you mentioned that there are essential medicines. I would dare to say that there are uh, some medicines that are more essential than others, and there are some patients that are more essential th than others. And in my country, as in many other countries, we spend far too much money on patients like myself, males above 50. While we should spend much more money on females and on children, how could WHO address the, uh, the, the possibility to, to put priority on cheaper or medicines without the cost for the youngest patients? Because when we save a child, we, uh, we will give them 75 hours, uh, 75 years of full quality of life. And these are low-hanging fruits because we cure children with cancer nowadays, 80%, with established cheap medicines. In our country, we, we try to, to, to cure the last 20, but we should start to cure more than 20% in the developing countries. Thank you, Mariangela. Do you have no, a... I think what you're posing yes. is a, a very important ethical question. If you have a, a, a low resource, setting who do you prioritize or what do you prioritize and, and the, the, I'm a pediatrician myself so I, I'm very partial to children but I, I'm also getting older so, so I understand the challenges also of, of people who have access to. So I, I think in a way we need to make sure that when governments incorporate uh, in their list new technologies, start buying that they are buying the right drugs to, for the addressing the most vulnerable of the populations in, in their list. Mm. Thomas? <clears throat> in principle, yes, I think prioritization you need, but I would challenge the assumption that you, by and large, simply spend too much on the rich and the elderly, because the biggest health progress made, when you look at it globally, is with Gavi immunization. And that's a lot on childhood immunization and millions of lives saved. It's also anecdotally, there's a big initiative, First Ladies Initiative in Africa on cancer. And I think the First Ladies met, if I'm not mistaken, in either Namibia or Botswana. And the meeting was hosted by the spouse. And he objected strongly because all the initiative was about breast cancer, it was about cervical cancer. And because of him, they also added prostate cancer. Men occasionally feel discriminated. So ev everyone has their own uh, yeah, thoughts on that. But I want to get back to uh, pricing of uh, medicine, since we have you here, Thomas. And Mariangela raised a question. What is actually a returnable uh, and a sustainable return on investment. Why should the drugs cost so much for those who can't afford them? Why do the poor ones have to die young? 
Do you have an idea for that? Do you think that's morally to have 20% return, for example? Basically, I would argue that you can't have a fixed number which is the return, because at the end of the day, when you look at how investment decisions are made, not by pharmaceutical companies, but by investors who put money in either consumer goods or pharmaceuticals or real estate, whatever, the pharmaceutical companies compete with other sectors of the industry and their one element is that the pharma business is much more risky than other business. Okay, instance, Maria Angela, do you agree? I mean, th this is an investment uh, for investors. They compete with everyone else. Why I should they have lower? I, th I think one of the things that we, we need to understand the, the health, which is actually a disease industry because it's pr providing uh, managed for us, also to prevent that. The health industry it cannot be equated Cannot, could, should not be compared like a, a just a, a, a real estate or a construction. Why not? You know? it, it's a commercial business. No, it's a commercial business, but it has a, a, a bigger calling as well. I think many of the companies have on their, on their constitution or their mandate the bigger calling of improving global health. You okay. know? And no, let, let me just say something, because the other day I was reading on, on one of the this newsletter that, for example, one problem that a, a specific company was having with a hepatitis C drug, it was written like that, was that it cured the patients. So it was decreasing the number of patients that could benefit mm -hmm. from. Okay, before I let Thomas in, Arnie, what are your thoughts on this? So I have two thoughts on this, and I'll be brief. I think the first thing, by the way, I did a degree from the London School of Economics, so I know a little bit about economics. And, and one of the 101 things that we learn <laughs> is volume and pricing. So if you look at the Indian market, you've got a huge volume and you've got an increasing volume, and your prices can, can be related to that volume. So that's the first thought. I think the second thought is the model that we are adopting in India is a differential model. So if you're very poor, you don't pay. But we're going to set up fantastic facilities that the rich will want to come. We will get them to pay and subsidize the poor. So there's something in that that industry needs to think about. The pharmaceutical industry and the devices industry focus all their strategy on high-income countries. They need to start yes. thinking about how their strategy can fit low- and middle-income countries as well. Okay, the pharma industry has a bigger calling, Maria Angela says, and uh, there was some economics here too. There are economics, and, and basically, when you look at the pharma industry's business model, it worked fantastically well for the industry as well as for society, because we went tremendous progress. I think what we are now challenged today, and there I agree with Mariangela as well as with Arnie, is it's not good enough to bring our medicines to those in the rich countries. And there's a price volume element. There's an element, and I... Um, this morning actually looked up, in 2003 already, G7 said there should be no price referencing to discounted prices. I think one of the key elements is what did work in the HIV AIDS area and needs to work in the cancer area too, that it becomes the norm that you have tiered pricing and patients or governments in India or Africa will pay significantly less than in Sweden. I see that this is moving. Five years ago, most of the pharma CEOs would have said it's not possible because there's no acceptance of this social contract. I now hear them say, we are doing it and we are willing to do it. So it's happening. I think there's some development and in in the, some positive developments, but uh, there is so much to do, right, Thomas? Uh, there's so so much ahead of us, and, and, the, and the reality is that the data that I show, it's, it's actually, it actually speaks by itself. Okay, if you want to solve a problem, uh, one of you, I think some of you talked about new kind of partnerships. What kind of new partnerships would you like to see uh, for the future, Ani, um, to, to, to get more equal access to, to cancer care? So I think it's important for us to leave this room in the knowledge that this is not just industry's responsibility. Yeah. It's the responsibility of the governments, it's the responsibility of every single one of us in this room, and it's the responsibility of industry. 
So we view industry as partners. Too long industry have been viewed as the bad guys. They're not the bad guys. We need to work together in partnership and get the pricing right for the economies that we're working in and for the patients that we care about. If we don't do that, the gap between the rich and the poor, the ones who are being treated in high income uh, countries and low and middle income countries will just simply get wider. So are you partners of Arnie's? <coughs> we are actually embracing partnerships on a big scale. I mentioned, you know, the UICC in, in the four countries. We are, have launched a health system strengthening project with the World Bank, and I'm meeting with Mariangela uh, quite frequently in Geneva because we talk about doing a partnership with WHO on how to improve access to breast cancer treatment, innovative breast cancer treatment, and also to diabetes treatment, and just to give you an anecdotal example, we'll jointly host a workshop on supply systems and the focus, because how can it be that Novo Nordisk basically gives insulin for cost in a country such as Kenya, and by the time the insulin reaches the patients who pays out of pocket, it costs five times as much, whereas when you look at Sweden, distribution margins are by 12%. Max. How is that? Uh, too many middlemen, uh, by the way, same in the US. Uh, too many people cutting a corner. Uh, too many actually counterfeit medicines. That's a serious issue. And that's why I really welcome that together with you know, the likes of UNICEF, Global Fund and others, we're looking into this because there are true efficiency gains to be made. And I see a really willingness in the new WHO leadership to look at the problem holistically, and I think the general program of work is great. Thomas, could, could you just comment on what uh, Mariangela said, that uh, you are not a typical commercial industry, you have a bigger calling. Would you agree on that? Yes and no. <laughs> because uh, sorry? <laughs> yes and no. Is that yes a, and no. Is that a yes Swiss and no, because uh, in question? terms of actually, when you look at the, Mariangela wasn't, she was still at UNAIDS uh, last year, uh, when we had the Fair Pricing Forum in Amsterdam, and it was the Secretary of State from the Netherlands who said the industry's business model is a dead end. And my reaction was, give me a break. We are now talking about too many innovations reaching the market in cancer and others. We can't afford them. We should look at the areas where actually the market is not working, such as antimicrobial resistance, such as neglected tropical disease. Therefore, the industry's business model, by and large, is working. On the other hand, we also need to acknowledge there are higher societal expectations for this industry than for others, mm. because it's not the same as selling Maserati or Rolls-Royce or Louis Vuitton. We are held to higher standards, and when something goes wrong, and something will always go wrong, we are rightly criticized and harshly criticized. So, Mariangela, if you wanted to see new kind of collaborations, or uh, what would you like to see? What is the most urgent one? I think one of, I think Thomas mentioned with like the last year before I joined WGO, we, we had a f fair price in forum. I think this type of, we are gonna do it one, do one, another one, uh, early next year, and, and I, I have a feeling we'll focus on cancer medicines as well, because this is the type of thing that can help countries to make up their minds on what to, to buy and how, how to best get a, a, a better price. On the other hand, I think the, the bigger issue that's in front of us for the next years, probably. I, I usually joke that some things will happen before I retire, some things won't happen before I die, but this pr should probably happen before I retire. <laughs> Which is the, that we, we should have a, a new kind of global agreement global. related, a new type of global agreement related to what, what is, does research and development brings to health and affordability. You know, of uh, uh, technologies for people actually to benefit all people, no matter where they were born. At least, Arnie, when you listen to those two, they're going to have many meetings huh, in the next coming days, years, months. Um, what kind of hopes does it give to you for your 
uh, staff and people back in India? Well, I think partnerships are key. I think also um, sharing um, what can be done, and actually what is being done in India is quite yes, phenomenal. Um, sharing those experiences with colleagues is helpful. I would say um, that uh, industry needs to open its eyes. Where is the market going to be in the future, right? If this is a business, look at the market, follow the market, and set your pricing accordingly. I, I also want to just say one last thing, and that is, what is our responsibility? Is our responsibility only to the patients, is my responsibility only to the patients that I treat in London, or is it to the globe? I think it is to people all around the world. Thank you very much, all of you. Good luck. Thank you.